This edition of the Roundtable brings together moderator Jeffrey Sherman and five thought leaders on structured products. Morris Chen, Samuel Garza, Andrew Su, Vitaly Liberman, and Ken Shinoda. The panelists will discuss the risk return characteristics of this asset class, their outlooks for the structured product subsectors, and the place of structured product securities within diversified investment portfolios. Structured products form a large, diverse area of the fixed income universe. They are also known as securitized assets or securitizations. Structured products securitize a wide variety of underlying assets. These include residential and commercial mortgages, bank debt, student and auto loans, credit card receivables, aircraft leases, and other receivables. These securities can offer yield and duration profiles that differentiate them from other debt instruments. Investors also can select structured product securities within given capital structures in an effort to target desired risk return profiles and express views on relative value. Moderator Jeffrey Sherman is Deputy Chief Investment Officer of Double Line Capital and a portfolio manager on a number of the firm's investment strategies. In addition, he hosts The Sherman Show, a podcast on investment, market, and macroeconomic themes. Morris Chen is a portfolio manager heading Double Line's investment team on commercial mortgage-backed securities and commercial real estate debt. He recently authored Commercial Real Estate Credit in Post-COVID-19 World, a paper available on DoubleLine.com. Ken Shinoda is a portfolio manager heading DoubleLine's investment team for non-agency residential mortgage-backed securities, whole residential loans, and other mortgage-related opportunities. He is co-author of the recent paper, Residential Market Update in the Year of the Pandemic and Economic Shock, available on DoubleLine.com. Samuel Garza is a portfolio manager overseeing Double Line's investment teams for macro asset allocation and collateralized loan obligations, also referred to as CLOs. Andrew Su is a portfolio manager heading Double Line's investment team focused on asset backed securities and infrastructure debt. Vitaly Liberman is a portfolio manager heading Double Line's investment team focused on agency residential mortgage backed securities. This edition of the Roundtable was recorded October 29th, 2020. All right, welcome to the next installment of the Double Line Roundtable series. Today, we're going to be discussing structured products. So I have five of the portfolio managers here at Double Line, who are the heads of the various teams across the structured product space. And they're going to share their insights about the structured products universe, uh, where the opportunities are, what risks lie out there, and more importantly, why investors should have structured products on their radar when thinking about fixed income investing. So, gentlemen, welcome to the show today. Okay, so um, I'm going to sound this out to you. I'll start with you, Sam. Um, what are some of the benefits of securitized actions? We call them structured products. We use those phrases interchangeably, structured products, securitized assets. What are some of the unique features about the securitized space, and why are they helpful for investors in seeking different types of credit exposure? Yeah, I, I think of... Uh almost everything in finance is a balance sheet, and particularly for uh, structured finance, it's a balance sheet. There's the assets and, the, and then the liability side, and just to simplify it, the assets in a mortgage-backed security would be all the mortgages, and the liabilities would be all the bonds. And one of the benefits of structured finance is you can pick what type of exposure you want. Do you wanna be the very best, or the very highest rated, or the least risky, uh, or do you want a return profile that is, um, effectively one with leverage so you can you know gain the highest possible returns and you can sort of pick your spot and you can look at relative value and determine make a determination what you think is the best relative value what's cheap what's expensive and so on and andrew i've heard you say something similar think about like a balance sheet but uh, maybe you can expand on what sam was saying about different credit qualities what does that mean to go up and down the capital structure yeah so um you know building on on sam's point there uh i, I would say one th one thing there's often a misconception that structured products is uh, you know, esoteric or very opaque. And I would actually argue that it's more transparent than corporates because we know what our assets are uh, on day one and you, you have full transparency into that and you do your analysis there. Whereas if you look at corporate assets, um, and this is no knock against corporate assets, it's just the management team can change the, the operations of that company or add debt, uh, leverage and increase equity, so forth and so on. So I would say that uh, the balance sheet analogy, I, I definitely like that. I just would say or emphasize that it's static 
and that it's very transparent versus probably some of the other investments. Now, your question on, on capital structures, uh, on the liability side, as, as Sam pointed out, the bonds or the tranche, tranches that we have on the liability side, uh, they're essentially stacked. So the senior most tranche will be the safest, and then as you move down that stack, it becomes riskier, and you know because of that, you're going to get some additional return. Yeah. So let me come back to you, Vitaly. So I, I, I emphasize here talking about structured credit, uh, but you focus on government guaranteed assets. Maybe you could give us a differentiation of how you think about the government guaranteed mortgage sector, and we'll juxtapose that against uh, how Ken thinks about it from the non-government guaranteed sector. Actually, it's, it's a good point. And just to add something to what my colleague said here is that I think the most distinguished part about the structured products is that you actually have real tangible assets that underlie the typical structures. If you think about again corporate bond or a treasury bond, you, you, usually you have a general guarantee of the corporation that they'll pay you back. Whereas in terms of the structured products, there is a specific asset that's going to serve as guarantee with respect to your ability to get back the, the, the cash flows or the principal and so on and so forth. So I think it's ultimately more analyzable from that standpoint, where you can understand what some of the characteristics and some of the risks and some of the scenarios are going to be beneficial or ne not necessarily, as we've seen in this environment, right, where we can kind of peg what, what things are and so on and so forth. Now, it, it's actually an interesting question you asked, and I think it's something that very few people know in a sense that when we think about the safety, right? If you look at your portfolio, if you look at your typical structure, right? You have your offense and defense, right? And your offense usually has credit and your defense is usually treasuries. Well, you have this whole field of securities with a huge market right now, seven trillion market, which in fact is either implicitly or explicitly guaranteed by US government or the government agencies. And I think in this instance, post-March, let's just say it's probably is guaranteed because Fed is directly buying them versus all this, you know, structures that have been put in place. So you have an ability to, to buy government guaranteed high credit spread products, right? So treasury, when you think about defense, you buy treasuries, you buy them because you want to have safety, but you don't really have a spread. Whereas here you have an ability not only to get the safety that you typically would get from treasuries, but you also have an ability to capture a spread uh, that will allow you to actually deliver higher returns. Now, as we perhaps we talk more about it, there is a nuance to that spread. And that's what makes this actually product a lot more exciting than anything else out there because that spread usually works in your favor, not just from the standpoint of ability to generate cash flows and you know that point in time, but there is an augmenting function where actually the yields returns could be amplified as things change. And that's really what we've taken advantage over the last 30 years as I've suggested. And that's why it makes this area very interesting for us. Okay. So Ken, when you're thinking about mortgage credit now as well, what's the difference between what Vitaly is describing and the government guaranteeing the mortgage and the space that you traffic within. Sure. Um, well, when you're thinking about a government guaranteed mortgage, you're get the government or the government entities are guaranteeing the principal interest. And really you're getting pay that additional yield to take on prepayment risk or you know, negative convexity, which we'll probably talk about later. Um, that's just basically call, call, call risk if you want to think about it more simplistically. Um, when you buy a non-government guaranteed security, now you have to deal with the default risk, right? Borrowers can default, if they default, what loss are you going to take? But as uh, my colleagues have mentioned, there's an asset and you can analyze the asset. And uh, at least in the, in the residential space, the asset's more homogenous. Morris will talk about how more idiosyncratic his space is. But in the mortgage space, you have a single family home. Average home is probably three bedroom, two bath, you know, 2,500 square feet. Median home price in America is 300K. People have a job. Their default's going to be linked to where unemployment is. And so we can actually take the loan to value that we get, um, which is more accurate today than it was in 05, 06 because of fraud back then. And we can take that loan to value, get a value on the property, find out how long it'll take to foreclose in each state. And we can derive what we think a, a recovery will be, right? And that same that's the same way you analyze really all securitized credit. You have an asset, you have a borrower. Is the borrower gonna prepay? If it's the borrower doesn't prepay, are they going to default? If they default, what's the loss going to be? If there's no collateral, like a credit card, it's going to be 100% loss. If there's collateral, whether it's a house or it's a, a used car, 
you, we can look at data and we can take that data and we spend a lot of money gathering that data and building models to analyze that data and we can derive these cash flows. So we just take any asset that's underlying these deals and we take that historical data and we use that to kind of build out those cash flows. Right. So you, uh, so Morris, Ken's talking about, oh, I'll have to use the math word here, the homogeneity of the, the home borrower. Uh, but there is a lot of heterogeneity within the commercial real estate market because um, we're talking about buildings and you know the office space. There's also different collateral types. So um, when you're thinking about the space too, um, what do you think is something unique to the commercial real estate market that's not shared uh, with these other sectors of the structured products market? Yeah, I mean, I think it, I think what's interesting is within the commercial real estate space, and you, you can choose as if, as opposed to the residential, you can choose. As an investor, what what exposure do you want uh, in terms of market, in terms of asset type? So, today I may like apartment buildings, while uh, you know later on as fundamentals change, uh, presumably as economy recovers, hotels may be the, the the flavor of the day. So, you know, as an investor, you're able to pick and choose what type of assets, commercial assets, you want to you want to. Um, Get exposure to at least from a bond investor perspective. I think that's the uniqueness of the uh, of the non-agency commercial mortgage bond market. Um, you're also, you know, the, the differences in, in itself in terms of looking at these. Um, you know, there's there's you know ver variety of, of types of cash flows that's underlying the building. Uh, office building is generated by um, long-term leases based on um, corporate tenants. Um, a retail asset such as a mall and or a retail uh, shopping center um, is is uh, you know you're more exposed to small businesses you know small business renters and uh, as well as uh, uh, as well as retail type uh, type clients and you know in hotel assets you can go to leisure or you could go to a business travel sort of segmented assets so you know there are the the different types of flavors uh, of the commercial real estate market is what makes it interesting in within CMBS. So what I'm kind of hearing from all of you here, if I was to summarize, is that there's there's inherent diversification within your sectors of the market too. You're talking about different collateral types. You're talking about different geographic regions. Uh, Vitaly, you've been talking about different um, uh, characteristics of the cohorts of borrowers. But let's go back to kind of how we thought about kind of the COVID environment. And Andrew, you brought up something very interesting. You said that you have the ability to analyze these cash flows. And so um, I pride ourselves as when we went through the crisis that we all said, look, we're not epidemiologists. We have opinions. We think we understand some of the data set. But one thing we do know is cash flow. How are you thinking about cash flows within, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, early on, uh, when there was a lot of uncertainty? There? How did you think about that and how you were going to allocate capital within the asset back market? Yeah, I mean, the pandemic was definitely a very interesting situation, something that none of us have, have been a part of. And literally, we went from 60 miles per hour to zero miles per hour overnight. And the lockdown, you know, it affected everyone, but there are definitely um, epicenter type sectors. Uh, and within the asset space, uh, transportation was one of them. I mean, we had uh, supply verticals shut down pretty much overnight uh, in between countries because they were trying to contain this pandemic. And then uh, for us, I mean, here in the United States, travel has been a, a big part of a lot of our daily lives, whether it's for leisure or whether it was for work. Um, and transportation virtually shut down. So we, we had some sectors that had huge drawdowns in, in, in pricing because of that, as a result of that. There was a lot of widespread panic that uh, this type of product would essentially not come back. Well, well, I, I think we took a longer term view. We looked at things and, you know, certainly there have been some severe headwinds here uh, in some of these sectors, uh, but there were huge opportunities as well. And I can just give you an example of one. Um, we had never purchased car rental asset backed securities. And just like air travel, I mean, car rental stopped when people started traveling, but we started looking at the analysis and we realized that the underlying assets um, to, to Vitaly's point here, that we can rely upon to, to liquidate in, in, in a case of distress was worth a lot more than what those bonds were trading at. So we started buying those assets and you know, taking a, a staunch view on certain sectors and expressing those views by uh, deploying capital into those areas. So yeah, th that's essentially you know, what we did, kind of really take views on certain sectors and, and uh, you know, express those views through outright purchases. Yeah, so stepping back a little bit, Sam, I remember in our daily investment meetings back in March too, we're trying to figure out what's going on and 
you came up with a way of thinking about the world and trying to frame a bit, frame it and the default experience from the global financial crisis. And so uh, obviously none of us had seen this before, but you went back to that rudimentary analysis that we all do, and it's the basics of bond investing, is follow the cash flow. And can you maybe walk some people through your ideas that you were thinking about back then and how you got comfortable with the CLO structures in terms of your stress testing? Again, not knowing what the path of the virus was, but going back to cash flow analysis. Yeah, um, <clears throat> when the pandemic hit and um, the markets tanked, uh, we went back to a scenario that we've been running for years. We basically re reran the default experience from the global financial crisis. Let's just to simplify it for a year, uh, corporate loans, which is the collateral and a CLO uh, defaulted at about 10%. So, um, and the recovery was around 50%. So we took that scenario and we applied multiples to it. And we said, okay, if we have the same experience from 2008 and we double it, what happens? Well, what if we triple it? And so um, we, tripled the, we, we tripled that default experience. And then we ran other scenarios. Um, Andrew alluded to some of the sectors that were um, very exposed, gaming, leisure, hospitality. And we said, okay, all of these ones for sure are gonna default. So we had that, and then we had the macro. And then we ran that through the capital structure and we were able to say, okay, even if we have this three times as bad as the last really bad experience, here's what happens. And we ended up at a, a, a part of the capital structure in a CLO that we thought was really robust to that cycle of defaults. We still liked even lower, but like at, in the worst of the worst moments, we're like, you know, it seems really unlikely we're gonna have an experience that's three times as bad as that. So we ran that. And again, I, I sort of at the outset talked about, you know, you can pick sort of your spot in the capital structure. Um, and when you run those defaults at the whole deal and you say, okay, everything single A and above is gonna look pretty good. And even some of the triple Bs, you say, when you look at those single A's that I feel really comfortable about with, they're really, you know, the prices are really low right now. And so I'm gonna sort of, you know, go from there. Um, and then as time went on, you say, okay, now it's not, maybe not gonna be three times bad, it's gonna be twice or one times. And eventually, you know, the market recovers over time. But it was really um, taking the experience from 2008 and then seeing, you know, as you run different scenarios based off of that. Yeah, and uh, that was very helpful as we were thinking about trying to get this comparable across all these areas, right? Because as you mentioned, you kind of have that macroeconomic volatility, but let's talk to both Ken and, and Vitaly in separate ways, the idiosyncratic nature of ultimately the default problem and forbearance within the US, right? So forbearance is providing homeowners the, the ability to skip payments. So let's start it on the credit side. Obviously that seems way more exposed than the government guaranteed side. Let's talk about those interactions. So maybe Ken, you can walk us through some of that thinking about what happened during forbearance, how you were thinking about it, and how you were saying, okay, this was a big curveball the administration threw us. What do we do with it? Well, um, you know, the initial reaction for all sectors when when March hit and the lockdown came was we all sat there saying, okay, unemployment's going to spike. We don't know how bad it's going to get. Economic activity is going to shut down. Like we don't know how people are going to react. Like we don't know how consumers are going to react. We don't know how businesses are going to react. Um, and it's really that uncertainty that created um, a lot of the distress in the marketplace uh, combined with liquidity. And liquidity improved first because the Fed stepped in. And then what you saw was that you needed time to pass for that uncertainty to go away because you needed to get data to show you, okay, well, what did consumers do? Like, what did businesses do? Did they uh, fire people? Did consumers lose their jobs? Or did they actually start making payments? And I would say that I think most of us were kind of surprised about how resilient the consumer ended up being at the end of the day. Part of it definitely has to do with the amount of um, fiscal stimulus that came out and the CARES Act and unemployment benefits and so on and so forth. So once we started seeing the data, um, first we did kind of the same analysis that um, Sam was thinking about. Okay, well, what if it's as bad as 07, 08? Um, we, did, we definitely didn't think it would get that bad uh, for, for housing, at least, just because you didn't have the same setup. You didn't go into COVID with massively loose underwriting, no money down loans, oversupply of housing. In fact, we went into COVID with not enough homes. And you've heard me talk about this a lot is the, the lack of available inventory for sale that you're seeing in the news. That's why home prices keep going up. We were about a million and a half homes available for sale. That is lower than the amount of homes available for sale in 1983 when that data started getting calculated. And think about how much the population has grown since then, right? So we were we felt okay about housing. We thought housing maybe will go down 10% just because if you wanted to buy a house, you're gonna bid back five, 
ended up not happening. Um, but then we had to think about, okay, what's the bar we're gonna do? Then the FHFA, which governs over Fannie and Freddie, came out and they said, okay, we're gonna use this forbearance program. And we've seen this before, we've used this before. You've heard me talk about the hurricane. Um, um, that's kind of where we went to. We said, okay, we've seen forbearance in use when you've seen natural disasters. And the pandemic is kind of like a natural disaster. It's just that it's a hurricane that's hitting everywhere and it's not going away, at least not yet. And what you saw is that what happens is, okay, a hurricane hits, uh, let's use Puerto Rico, because that's the example I use. Um, we had securities that were 100% Puerto Rico. We saw borrowers miss payments, and then the island opened back up, the economy opened back up, people go back to their work, and then we started seeing the borrowers make payments again. And what you see is an initial spike in delinquencies, and then subsequently that comes down through time. And uh, we saw spikes go up about 20% of borrowers in this one security um, that were not delinquent, became delinquent, went into forbearance. What forbearance allows you to do is miss up to 12 payments, not hurt your credit score, which is very important to most Americans. And then you can actually now take those 12 payments, those missed payments, and you can throw them on the back of the loan. And most people have a 30 year mortgage, so that's a long time from now, right? And um, that now allows time for the consumer to heal, for the economy to heal, hopefully open back up and a larger degree next year. And so what you saw was that forbearance number go up to about 78% um, on the whole universe. It was about five to 6% for Fannie Freddie loans that are higher quality. It was about 10, 11% for Gini Mae loans, which are worse quality, and they, they start coming back down. But ultimately what you're worried about is losses. So again, we go back to the data, we look at the global financial crisis, and so we see that borrowers that took out a loan in 2006 and seven, and that those are borrowers that took out a loan at the top. Like they probably bought when home prices were the highest, more of those borrowers didn't put money down. Home prices collapsed. About, and that was about 17 to 18% of Fannie Freddie borrowers. 65% of them roughly didn't default because time passed, the economy opened up, back up. And so if you look at borrowers that took out a home in 2000, 2002, 2003, almost over 80% of those borrowers didn't default. They went delinquent, but they didn't default. So going delinquent doesn't mean ultimately defaulting. Time passes, you get your job back, you start paying again. So we, we had to look at kind of how high those forbearance numbers or those delinquency numbers got, and then make an assumption about how many of those borrowers would ultimately recover. During hurricanes, about 95% of borrowers ultimately, ultimately recover. So if you do the analysis and say, okay, let's take that seven, eight percent and let's just say it's worse than a hurricane, but it's not as bad as a global financial crisis. So we'll use that 2000, 2003 homeowner that had maybe equity left in this house, um, we get to about something like 25 basis points of loss, assuming um, you know, this pull through rate of, of, of people uh, defaulting ultimately and, and the losses. And that's pretty low, 25 basis points. So if you have any subordination, you're not really gonna take a hit. And that's kind of what the market's thinking right now. And what you've seen is the only type of securities that are have not recovered are the ones that have very little of that support. So that small amount of loss is gonna hit them. And uh, that's kind of how we, we, we thought about it. And it's looking back at history, looking at the global financial crisis, but then augmenting it because this is not the global financial crisis. This is different. And as time passes, we get more data to help us come to these conclusions. Right, so there's a couple of things in there. And Vitaly, I wanna continue the thought about the mortgage market. And you're talking about government guaranteed mortgages. So walk me through the scenario that Ken paints here too, but um, and then I'm gonna pick up something after that as well. Yeah, so I think the way we look at the agency MBS and you know both CMBS or MBS is it actually serves two roles and those roles will change depending on where we are. So as COVID hit, the first role was defense, right? That's why you have, you know, you remember I mentioned about the treasuries, but treasuries kind of with a spread, the way to think about it. So the first role that we had for that portion of the portfolio was to play defense. And we'll talk about it, how that was. And then subsequent to that, when volatility picks up, when uncertainty, uncertainty ensues, that's when you can start to play offense. So the first goal is let's survive, let's protect the capital, and then we can play the offense. So let's talk about the defense first. So as I've mentioned to you, we've done this for about 30 years. And the one, you know, or, or longer, but certainly in, in the context of what we're doing here, and the one thing we could rely on is whether something is a default or a prepay, or, or a prepay, it's all prepay to us. We get back par. So the way we had to think about the mortgage market is not from the standpoint 
of what the forbearance is going to be right away or default. What we had to think about, what would be the macro function reaction in the marketplace overall? What has happened in the past? I can tell you what happened in the past. Front end rates go down, Fed basically cuts rates. Always, they always tell you they're not going to do it, they always do it, right? You know, rates typically go down, right? So you have to have, you have to be in a position to take advantage of that, right? Then you're going to have a shakeout of levered players, right? Usually that's what happens because they never thought that spreads could ever widen or they never, you know, they're always going to be offsides. When you say levered players, a lot of times these are REITs. And REITs, whatever, whatever the structure yep. might be. I, you know, the guys who are hedging IOs with POs, you know, circa 1994. You know, so you're going to have players that have put themselves in a position that they can't recover from. And that's going to generate offensive opportunities. So first, you have defensive opportunities. I'm sorry, first you, you have to survive. You have to protect the capital. That's what that's done, right? So we, what we've seen and we've learned in 08, right? And nothing, you know, like Mark Twain said, you know, history doesn't repeat itself with its rhymes, right? So what we knew is that Fed will buy mortgages and Fed will, Fed will buy treasuries. They had nothing else, right? They, they obviously could come up with all those programs, but that's the first thing they're going to do. So the, the issue was when will they do it? When are they going to wake up? We didn't know that, but we positioned for that. So that means you have to be liquid, you have to be in, a, in types of securities that Fed is likely to buy. Then you start to analyze what are they going to buy next. So that's your defense function and that's exactly what we've done. We knew they're going to buy agency CMBS next because they've never done this, but you know, what's the difference between Fannie Mae guaranteed residential mortgage security or commercial, right? So we figured that's that function. We played it perfectly, I think, right? We bought them in anticipation. So that's the first a kind of line of defense. That's an easier thing, right? We've seen it before. There's going to be variation on it, but okay, we, we can deal with that, right? Nothing is going to be perfect, but certainly. Now, second thing is, well, then there's going to be a, a structural change in the marketplace, right? As Ken mentioned, you know, you went from zero delinquencies to, you know, as high as, you know, uh, I think highest number was right around eight and a half percent or closer to nine percent, right? So there is a fundamental shift in the marketplace and therefore market has to adapt and figure out what that means. Does it mean a prepayment? Does it mean a default? It means nothing. So there is going to be a dispersion of assumptions that's going to be in the marketplace. And that's really when you can start to make money. Because when market is kumbaya and everybody on the same page, you ain't making money because it's all priced in. Right when you know when things are you know everybody doesn't see a risk and you know that's probably going to be more defensive. You want to be the most offensive when there is a lot of uncertainty, because then you can rely on the ability to understand the historical precedent, whatever helps you. The framework we have and certainly, you know, help of Jeffrey being there for so long and being through those things, where you can start to put together a framework as to how you're going to benefit from that particular development. So as I've mentioned to you, when new rates are going to go down, that means that prepayments will spike. That means that certain things are going to happen. That means certain types of securities are going to appreciate. Certain types of security are going to depreciate more than they should have. That's when you buy them, and so on and so forth. That becomes technical. But I think the ability to discern and understand this, it's kind of like triage, right, in, at a hospital, right? When the patient gets, gets in, the first thing is you got to diagnose the situation. Right? And then experts will take care of what, what needs to be done. Right? So I think this you know, ability to diagnose the situation in a coherent way, where I can go to Andrew, I can go to Morris or Ken, what's happening in your market, understanding that nobody knows. Right? That gives you a very good indication that opportunity set is there. It's time to act. Yeah. So Morris, uh, Vitaly is here talking about Kumbaya and markets. I think of, of all the players here, the one who has the least amount of kumbaya <laughs> and the most level of uncertainty is your market. So how are you reacting to this initially? How has your thought process changed a little bit as you've seen more data? I think Ken's been harped on this for long periods of time of saying that, you know, one thing that we know, time, we will get more data, we'll know more, we can analyze more. How are you thinking about this? We've never seen a, a pandemic in our lifetimes and especially with um, uh, in a publicly traded commercial securities market. Right. I, I would say the clearly, you know, you can kind of look into the liquidity of that of the CMBS market. Initially, you know, it was similar to stru other structured product sectors. Um, it, it dried up. And as we kind of thinking about that, you know, that led to price actions uh, on a uniform basis, all prices going down. 
uh, and you know, from a you know, from a structured credit perspective, in terms of the credit profile of a CMBS security, you can buy a lower rated bond, or you could buy a higher rated bond, just based on the inherent credit risk that rate agencies kind of assign to it. But at the end of the day, um, if you if you kind of dig into the underlying asset and, and and try to comprehend what's you know what what is the underlying exposure, um, it helps you you know f uh, rationalize uh, is this still a good investment or is this a bad investment? And and I would say a pandemic led uh, situation. Um, there's clearly a lot of questions surrounding what's going to happen to office, what's going to happen to apartments, what's going to happen to hotels, um, and um, you know this is. You know, these are questions that, you know, from a e initial immediate reaction perspective, you know, just from experience within the commercial real estate sector in the past, um, buildings don't trade uh, as a public security does. So an apartment building that's under or an office building that's underlying a CMBS security in itself, s some things and steps needs to happen. Um, and, you know, we, you know, we had to wait and, and watch the data set uh, uh, in itself in terms of performance data over time um, before we took um, a lot of these uh, initial initial actions in terms of thinking about, you know, what is what is viable in a post pandemic world and what is what is viable at this juncture. So I'll use an example, um, you know, from a hospitality asset perspective, um, initially travel stop, um, you know, transportations and, and airports and, and whatnot, this, the shutdown in place uh, impacted hospitality sector as a whole. Um, you can, one can jump to, it's easy to jump to the conclusion that no one's going to use these hotels. What's going to happen? Um, and all the hotels are going to go bad. And, and, you know, through, through, you know, as the months kind of went on, you know, we started to realize that actually all, some hotels are actually being utilized to full utilization versus others. And you start, you know, ration, and you start comprehending that assets that need to, uh, assets are located in, let's just say Hawaii. Um, they're going to fare a lot worse than an asset that is actually drivable to you know, a hotel that is in, in is in within the uh, uh, within a certain amount of radius within California that you can drive to. That's actually going to fare better than an asset such as Hawaii, where tourism um, and, and, the, and the flight traffic has, has, has stopped. Um, and in similar form and fashion, there's also different types of hospitality assets that that um, garner different types of clientele. Um, not many people are taking vacations. Uh, but a low-end hotel where it's servicing uh, servicing um, 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 hospital workers and servicing uh, the essential, essential working sort of community, those assets actually have uh, actually perform well. So, you know, to, to kind of describe our sort of thought process, you know, looking at the hospitality sector as a whole, um, you know, the way we did it was, you know, clearly you have to monitor what the performance data was. Make sure to comprehend what's going underlying these market fundamentals and changes, um, and think through rationally. You know what? You know, does this make sense? And I think commercial is interesting in the, in the sense that, you know, this is a sector where you're always getting. I mean, I would say on a weekly basis, two to three uh, articles that's printed, whether by the journal or by Bloomberg or by within financial blogs. Um, that talk about the gloom and doom of the commercial real estate sector as a whole. Uh, two days ago. Right, right. Um, but I and, and you know, with with all you know, with all certainty, I would say there is a lot of concern. There's a, a, a lot of unprecedented um, changes that's going on. Um, but as a as an investor and a practitioner within within this this area, um, I, you know, it, in summary, you have to you have to understand what the fundamental trend is. And, and you know, for us, it's um, and that, that comes with patience, right? And just comes with uncomprehending. You, you know, I just inter one interjection there, and I think Morris talked about it, is that this pandemic is so different than the 08 financial crisis. And certain things, and I absolutely agree with uh, Sam and, and Ken in terms of like looking at the financial crisis and, you know, layering on some some uh, uh, some multiplier on, on, you know, what occurred back then. But what's really interesting is, is you're seeing some changes in consumer behavior. Um, or, or pe people's behavior. I shouldn't say consumer, just people's behavior. So, you know, are, are those going to persist post COVID? I mean, that's something you're going to have to take a view on. Certainly that will affect certain areas of CMBS. It will affect all of our areas, but that, that is probably the, the one nuance here is really, are there any permanent 
uh, side effects from COVID. Um, yeah. That's something we're going to think yeah, about. Yeah, I've been of the belief that this is a defining moment in our lifetimes. Like We will change taste, preferences, behaviors, and that's something that we all have to try to think about. But I think Morris brought up a good point, too, of the idiosyncratic nature, the headline risk, and no one wants to own risk, right? Yeah. People want return. They don't want risk. But we know with some of the influence of the Fed and, and other players in the market that a lot of this uh, return potential has been diminished. So what has changed? Uh, Andrew, you bring this idea up about the financial crisis and how it's different. What's changed about the sector? Because headline risk, what was blamed? Mortgages for the last crisis, right? It was, it was the unscrupulous behavior of the underwriters, of the lenders, as well as just ultimately the borrower, right? So Sam, put on your hat here. Tell me how the markets evolved with structured products and why you feel comfortable about them relative to where they were in history. And now, I know CLO is one of the better performing securitized assets back in the crisis, but maybe you can talk about how the markets change and how the improvements have happened within the structures. Yeah, I mean, CLOs are a good example just to sort of focus on CLOs. Um, in the, the, the financial crisis back in 2008, as we all know, the story was subprime, but it spilled over into structured finance broadly. Uh, there's a bad uh, three letter word or acronym CDO that is out there. And I always call it a C blanco. It doesn't matter that middle thing. Yeah. It starts with a C and ends with the O, it's an O no. It, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and so CLOs sound very similar to CDOs, and there's a lot in common there. Um, but one of the things that happened after the financial crisis, for example, um, just to look at CLOs, pre 2008, a typical CLO had a lot of bank loans in there, which is the, the bread and butter collateral. It also had high yield bonds. In some cases, it had um, uh, subprime CDOs. So, you know, they were a small part of the portfolio. The portfolio wasn't clean. It was pretty, it, there, in some cases, there was a lot of stuff thrown in there. Um, and also, um, the experience from ABS CDOs, where a lot of deals all the way up to AAAs um, defaulted, uh, that drew a lot of criticism for uh, rating agencies. And so one of the things you've seen um, since then for CLOs, which is again, collateralized loan obligations, close, but not CDOs, is the average pool is very clean. It's typically only bank loans today. There's no other CDOs. There's no, this is a crazy market if I explain it now, but there were CLOs of other CLOs or CDOs of other CDOs back in 2008. That doesn't exist anymore. And also the rating agency's got some uh, level of conservatism. So the when you look at a structure finance deal, you always want to know how much uh, credit support do I have? If I'm buying this CLO tranche that is backed by $500 million of uh, bank loans, I, do I have $50 million of losses that I can absorb or do I have you know, uh, 20, uh, $250 million? And um, all of those measures per rate equivalent rating. So if you take a, a triple B CLO back uh, you know, 12 years ago, the average credit support was 8%. And now that number is about 11. So there's a little bit more credit support. Um, so when I look at the CLOs, the portfolio is cleaner. Um, uh, there's more credit enhancement. And this is something that most people outside of the space wouldn't think about, but is actually the documents. The documents are a lot cleaner. Um, when we look at a deal, there's three things, three boxes we check. We look at the collateral, we look at the manager who's managing the CLO, and then we look at the documents. And the documents are basically a legal document that allow the manager to do different things. And after the experience of 2008, that's a lot cleaner. So I think when you compare now to 2008, um, in all ways, um, the actual structure and the makings of the structure have generally gotten cleaner. Now, of course, there's other risks we can talk about more leverage for corporate bonds and corporate loans and things like that. Um, but the actual deals are a lot cleaner than they were before. And the last thing I'll add there um, is that CLOs in the last financial crisis actually did quite well. Um, very different than, than the subprime CDOs that uh, got a lot of notoriety. So you, you're starting from a good place, structures are cleaner. Um, and so I think in general, you know, it's a sort of the makings of something that you can look at and say, okay, I think I know what this is going to do. And also it's a little bit better than before in some ways. Right. And even, even based on corporate America, occasionally there's fraud, but it's not rampant. Like Ken brought up, like in the mortgage market, there was fraud on all sides, right? Yeah. Borrowers, lenders and the like, and just no one caring at the point in time. Andrew, we don't hear that a lot about ABS. You don't hear about the credit quality and the enhancements. Can you talk about the evolution of your space and what's, what's, uh, what's really gained, uh, garnered confidence from you to really want to do more and more in the ABS space? 
Yeah, um, I mean, the ABS space has just come a long way. Um, honestly, we weren't big investors in, in ABS back during the last financial crisis. And, you know, part of it was just there's better relative value away. Uh, and part of it was the fact that the ABS market was largely a consumer market at that time. So when I say consumer, I'm talking about credit cards, auto loans, student loans. And, you know, sure, some of those could be exciting at certain times, but there were definitely better opportunities away. Now, if you look at the ABS market today, it is a very different picture. You still have the consumer assets in there. So the student loans, credit cards, and autos are definitely still there, and they're big issuers in the space. But you have other issuers coming in. So you have whole business, which is more akin to, to the corporate issuer coming into this space. You have renewable energy. You have other hard assets, such as uh, transportation assets. And then you also have uh, you know, areas that may have some issues, such as uh, in the high-yield space, energy which they're having a very tough time getting additional financing. They're coming into the asset back space, pledging very high quality assets in order to get some liquidity. So it's really interesting because that market has developed uh, from, I guess, more of a myopic consumer focused uh, sector to a very open macro type sector where you get, can get a lot of diversification. Now, certainly there's risk, right? When you, you start bringing these different types of assets in, uh, it could increase the, the element of complexity and therefore maybe perhaps risk. Uh, but also, you're able to, as these new types of assets come in, you're able to pick up some tremendous spread. So uh, that is really you know, the work of this group here is you know, we're doing the analysis and trying to determine if that risk or the complexity that we're going to take on, are we getting compensated via return? Yeah. Uh, and uh, we know about... Um you know, your side, Ken, we've talked about that, but Vitaly, how has the mortgage market changed in the government guaranteed side? I mean, we know that the Fed's been a big, big player there. We know the government has was one of the biggest issuers of mortgages and guaranteed mortgages as we came out of the financial crisis. How has that evolved in your sector? And are there differences in structural protection that Sam and Andrew are describing? Are they relevant to your market? Yes, I, I think it's a good question. And maybe I can start by answering the question you posed to Sam, because I think it's very important. And that's actually going to lead into something we talk here is I think the biggest change we've observed is the response time that and, and the result of that response from the standpoint of Fed and other entities that they're in place to protect the financial stability of the markets. So if I look back at 2008, we had three, four, five years to put on a trade, right? And the kind of wides existed for some time. You didn't have to be quick. You don't have to be in any way, shape, or form as nimble. Whereas if you look right now and you look at the typical suspects, you look at your, you know, let's say agency MBS space, you look at your corporate space, you look at your treasuries, the opportunity set, so to speak, is gone, you know, at least from the spread standpoint. So in the past, you had time to, you know, get your bearing, you know, get your things together right and invest. Now, that opportunity set is gone. Really, what we have here in structured product land that Morris talks about, or Sam or Andrew, there's still quite a bit of opportunities because Fed was uneven in its response. And that's what I'm trying to get to, right? Is that it wasn't a unified response. Okay, we're going to backstop every single marketplace. We're going to play God. We're going to pick and choose which markets we're going to backstop and which markets we don't. We think hotels suck, so we're not going to backstop them, but we're going to backstop something else, right? That, we're going to be God in this marketplace. And what that does, it creates disparate experience for different investors. So let's talk about agency MBS, right? And if you look, about, if you look at agency MBS, you know, there's two types of securities, which are really the same, but they kind of trade difference. There's what's called pass-through securities. You, you know, it's probably what you, you know, think about when you think about the mortgages, those large trusts where mortgages get aggregated, sold to investors, and just interest in principle gets passed through. That's what we think about the mortgages. There's also this category of securities, which are called CMOs, right? It's oh, a it's a C and an O. It's a different uh -oh. CMO. Uh -oh. It's uh -oh. a different, it's, yeah. it's actually one of the good ones because <laughs> There are, there it depends are, what price you pay. <laughs> yeah, right. they're, they're, they're really the same. They're the same credit quality. There's no difference. They're backed by the same agencies. But Fed never bought them. So remember I mentioned to you that you have to think about your know, response. And certainly when pass-throughs tighten in, when Fed bought them, CMOs did not right away. That created an opportunity, right? So now what, what has changed in the marketplace if, is that for the longest period of time, there was this perception that prepayments rates cannot reach a certain point, right? You know, 
20 CPR, 25 CPR, whatever that might be. Certainly how certain collateral will behave and so on and so forth. And we've blown through all those barriers, right? We're way past that. Things that people would bet your arm and a leg on that it's never going to happen, happened, you know, times five. So I think what people have learned is that never say never. And I think you guys, Jeffrey mentioned that you and him talking about you never means tomorrow. That's really what this means now. And therefore, people are very cautious in their pricing of risk right now. Right? They understand that there's no issue with credit quality. There's never been an issue. So Fed solved the liquidity issue, right? But idea that things can change in a dime is very pervasive in the marketplace. And therefore, what it does, it creates an opportunity set where you had different dimensions of risk that you can explore and structure portfolios that create very attractive structures. Well, it's funny you mentioned that too, because you say that you know, people thought that the prepayment speeds, that is the refinancing activity or the default behavior in your space uh, could never exceed a threshold. And it's a complacency issue of people not observing it. We know back in 03, right, yeah. that we had massive amount of prepayments, yeah. right, because of huge refinancing activity. So um, what it is, is being a student of history as well, not getting stuck in this idea of just having, you know, whatever the status quo is. It's like, so It's like Turkey, right? Your happiest day is day before Thanksgiving, right? Because, you know, you've been fed, things were good to you, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right as you about to... <laughs> leave it to Vitaly to bring that, that part up. So uh, <laughs> that's why we love Vitaly. So well, what, maybe, one thing you didn't talk yeah. about that's new is what happened post-crisis is all of the stuff that used to go to the credit markets, or most of it in the multifamily space, that all went to the agency space. So there's this growing market that's about a trillion dollars that's agency mortgages, government guaranteed, but it's backed by commercial assets. And you can, you know, with a, with a, uh, a voter in a house, you can't get put a prepayment penalty on their home. Everyone can refi. It's your uh, given right here in America. You get a free call on rates. Yeah. If you take out a mortgage, you actually get a free put because you can throw the house back. Yep. Um, but if call you're a commercial, put, if you're a you commercial don't have borrower, to, you actually don't have to pay for it either. Yeah, that's, we found <laughs> until, that out during until the, the December, until crisis. the end of this but year. Commercial loan, you can put this thing called yield maintenance. So you can't just refi, and that creates this really interesting uh, structure in the mortgage market. And we've been using more and more of that in a lot of our portfolios. You wanna, you wanna touch on that for a little bit? Yeah, 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 I think that's actually an interesting point that Ken makes is that uh, the way we invest and develop themes in terms of investing, right, is we l always look in, in simple terms at upside versus downside. I know it sounds silly, but you know, that's very controversial in investment cycles often, right? <laughs> because it's very difficult to frame the upside, it's very difficult to frame the downside, but that's really what we do, right? If you think about, a secret sauce kind of, right, is what's my upside, what's my downside, what's my base case scenario? Do they kind of align in a certain way, right? And, and then you try to probabilistically weight them and figure out where it is, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I know it's very simple, but believe you me that that's not really done in the marketplace. So we always understood what the downside in that agency commercial mortgage back market was, but we really did couldn't pinpoint the upside. How how much, how, what kind of price appreciation can you experience in those securities? And it's always held us back. We understood the structure, we understood all these characteristics. And recently, I think, as, as probably around three years ago, we really put a significant effort into this, right? We, you know, we have guys who are dedicated to, to this space that that's all they do, uh, you know, they look at the stuff and they, kept on telling me, Vitaly, this stuff can go up a lot. This stuff can trade at 120, 130s, right? And, and they finally convinced me. And I went to Jeffrey and I said, look, this stuff is legit, right? It, yes, it can go down. That, yes, it, has, it can also go up, right? But you have this function there, which Ken talked about, the yield maintenance, which works well when actually prepayments increase. If you probably know in mortgage market, the prepayments is your enemy because you only get back par, so that limits how much price can go up. In agency CMBS market, actually prepayment is your friend because it augments your returns, right? So when we look at the security, your yield is struck, you know, when you think about treasury bond, right? You give me the price, I give you the yield, right? That's simple as that, right? Same with corporate bonds. In mortgages, you there is a second component to prepayment, right? And usually when we calculate the return, you have to peg where that what that prepayment is going to be. And we usually, you know, our markets are very conservative from that standpoint. But this additional prepayment experience and that yield maintenance actually augments your return. And it comes exactly at the time when you want because that's when rates go down, opportunities that is bigger, all those good things. So it's actually becomes a perfect complement from the standpoint that, in fact, at the time exactly when you 
the yields are scarce, right? We all can talk about the, what the spreads are. Where there is really lack of yield, you have this government guaranteed securities, which are to very reasonable scenarios, out yield anything out there. So that becomes a very interesting component. And not just from the yield standpoint, also from the ability to play the defense. Remember, we're always thinking about this, can it play defense, right? So it can do those two things. It can play defense and offense under different scenarios. So that is a big change that we see. Okay, so I think we're gonna take a break here. Um, we're going to let the users go and click on the links and go take a bathroom break. And we'll let Vitaly re reboot here, um, you know, get, get some new fodder. So we'll take a break here. Thanks for tuning in. We'll come back to the second episode shortly and we'll pick up and talk about market opportunities and why we uh, feel very strongly about the structured products market going forward. Stay tuned.